Um, but uh, find ways to, to be motivated and get creative um, and know that uh, as far as validating for us, for the PAT, uh, it's, it's in good timing. It's just, it's not gonna happen right now. Uh, we have some other things on the plate with internal affairs, uh, looking to get some pre-hires in. Uh, and it looks like that's gonna be a pretty heavy uh, amount of folks uh, to get tested. Um, so to time in with the department to get an incumbent time uh, for uh, going into 2021, uh, just patience there. Uh, but do know that I'm available. Reach out to me, look at the video, uh, look at the peer site um, on the resource site, go to the peer site, look at the uh, fitness. Um, uh, Jake Wardlaw and some others have done a really fine job with putting that page together for exercise examples, uh, for uh, nutrition examples. Uh, so check that out. There's some good videos on there. Lieutenant uh, McKay, uh, he has some good uh, 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 cooking uh, tips and nutrition. Um, but check that out. Reach out to me for any questions that you have moving forward with that. Um, but think about, uh, uh, let's, let's kick start with uh, getting some new kicks, get some new kicks on there, and, uh, and then we'll just take baby steps from there. So. Okay. Thank you. Nancy? I hate a mask. Just <laughs> let you know that right up front. I'm a talker, and I'm a hugger, and I'm hating this COVID. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm Dr. Nancy Wesselink. I've been around a while, um, started this back in 94 when they asked for some folks to come down to Atlanta to train prior to the Olympics on the mental health side, disaster mental health. So I got my feet wet real fast with the whole emergency ops situations uh, from Secret Service all the way down to the local cop. And it was an amazing, amazing thing. And of course, I got called out, which was my first real experience with critical incident response. Um, I've since picked up by Atlanta full time in the Bureau of Psych Services. I stayed there until um, the early twos. And then um, I had off and on been working for, for the local EAPs and national EAPs as a provider. Uh, and the more I spent time around public safety, the more I realized that there was a dearth of really good, effective mental health resources for them. Unfortunately, it's not changed a whole lot. It's gotten a little bit better. Um, so in O2, I uh, started one source and uh, took a hundred bucks out of my pocket and sort of turned it to God and said, let's see what happens. And uh, we've been going strong ever since. So I'm happy to be here. Um, this is this is something that's near and dear to my heart. I've probably done hundreds of SISM interventions. Um, just want to be, you know, the person that uh, that's trusted, uh, that, you know, you can call anytime and uh, I don't mind commuting. I live up in the mountains now, but um, I'm always where I need to, to be when I need to be there. So thank you again for having me today. Great. Nancy, of course, hit on one thing that we always talk about in stress management, and that is, you know, talking is the best man medicine. So uh, <laughs> finding somebody you can trust and talk with. And like Jess said, a lot of challenges with the social distancing that exists right now, um, you know, just in terms of general, you know, uh, physical wellness, but mental wellness as well. So, uh, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to people uh, and engage that process and whatever your needs are. Um, so, you know, uh, just getting started, getting a little bit more into a few things. Um, you know, number one, just uh, pulling this off of NFPA, um, you know, yesterday, um, our firefighter deaths, the uh, nature of injury, um, just wanted to kind of hit those numbers, just go over some of the things we're looking at this year. Of course, sudden cardiac death is at the top of that list. Um, you see trauma, burns, asphyxiation, strokes, gunshots, um, the electrocutions, the heat strokes on down, you know, at the bottom. But, you know, every one of these is, you know, important and certainly, you know, needs to be honored. Um, but um, one thing just thinking about with sudden cardiac of the death uh, is not only our, our general fitness, and of course, we've had the opportunity to have the heart scans done and to um, identify problems, um, you know, early uh, when they can be treated and taken care of. Um, but also think about the um, heat strain. Um, obviously, the heat stroke is on there. Uh, thermal in injury is on there. Uh, but think about what happens when you're in a, a very heavy uh, fire uh, environment um, and what it does in terms of taking the water out of your body, um, how that affects your blood plasma. Um, and they actually are looking at um, sudden cardiac event, um, you know, in relation to that because our blood becomes so thick that any small thing or even a problem that's not there can 
uh, manifest itself. Um, and so certainly we've seen that on the ignition team. Uh, Mike and I have the benefit of having been on the ignition team for a while. Um, we know the kind of a thermal strain that working in the burn room um, can put on you. Um, we've certainly felt it, um, but just pay attention to that, um, especially during these hot months. We did not have an acclimation period this year um, like we've had in, in the past. So the heat kind of came on suddenly. And I think we were dealing with a few dehydration issues um, in terms of that um, early on uh, in July. Well, not early on, but in July, um, they came on pretty quickly. And so just make sure that you're uh, dividing up that labor. Um, don't hesitate to call for help. Um, and remember, water today is for tomorrow. Try to do those prehydration, um, you know, things that you can do. And watch out for that caffeine as well, because it's going to push that water out of your system. Kind of on that thought, I thought I'd kind of pass it to Jeff for just a minute, see if he's got any thoughts about just diet, nutrition, and water that he could uh, weigh in on for us. So, Jeff? Yes, sir. Okay? Um, Nick, I don't know if you have this chart that you can pull it up or not, but uh, we have in most all the fire stations the check your urine. Uh, so you definitely, uh, there's a reason why we, we do want to see uh, our urine levels uh, just to make sure that we are uh, staying hydrated with that. Um, you may be able to put this up uh, if you're able to find that. Otherwise, uh, look in your nearest bathroom stall and it should be in there. Um, the uh, uh, recommendations uh, for, um, so um, Captain O'Shields has a good point uh, with, as far as the uh, recommendations of, of hydration. Um, so athletes, uh, which I do like to consider ourselves as industrial athletes, we are defined as that. Uh, so uh, any calls that we run on and even pre-shift, we need to make sure we're coming in hydrated. I understand uh, the, uh, the exchange, you know, at the uh, shift change, you know, and we're enjoying our coffee, talking about the days of uh, uh, the shift prior and the shift coming up. But be sure that you're uh, careful with how much uh, caffeine there is because it, it, it does, uh, as a diuretic, uh, um, pull hydration away, uh, which you're trying to get for, especially on these hot days. Uh, but um, you should really try to consume approximately one gram of carbohydrate per minute of exercise. So if you do think about going on a call, it could be an EMS call, uh, a heavy related EMS call that could take a half an hour. Uh, it could be a fire call um, up to an hour. Um, so with that, be sure that you're uh, replacing that hydration as soon as you can uh, when you turn back to the station. Um, so this intake uh, can... Um, can be achieved by drinking solutions that contain between 6 and 8% carbohydrate, okay? Um, our Gatorade that's provided to us uh, uh, through the county, uh, it's a little bit higher of a percentage of, of carbohydrate, um, so it doesn't get absorbed as quickly into the system, um, and that's, that's something that you just have to be careful with. Uh, look out there for some other uh, uh, replacement um, I think uh, liquid IV, there's, there's different uh, uh, options out there that are, can, they can provide a better balance of uh, that hydration. Um, six to 8% is, is, is just right for absorption into the body. Uh, but that one, um, you know, that one gram of carbohydrate. So um, if you work for an hour, you know, you need to get in that 60 grams of carbohydrates uh, uh, replaced after coming off that one hour call. Um, from the hydration. Um, so one pound is, is if you lose a pound, uh, if, if we happen to have scales at the stations, um, it'd be great if we did bring in one from the house, especially during the summer months uh, when you're going on these calls and you're coming back and you know you've lost a lot of weight uh, in your gear uh, working on a scene. Uh, but one pound uh, of body weight is about 16 ounces of fluid that you've lost, okay? So you have to just be mindful of that so that you do replace that, okay? Um, there's, uh, as Captain O'Shields had mentioned, there's, there's, when you lose that much water, uh, you run the risk of cardiovascular uh, uh, stress uh, on, on, your, on your system. 
So you need to be real careful and mindful uh, to make sure that you hydrate as soon as you can. Um, so I had another note in here that I wanted to mention as far as, all right, so are we still good on time? So good. Um, if you, if you lost, if you came off of the scene, you lost four pounds. Okay. More than likely that's going to be, uh, it's going to be fluid loss. Uh, it takes longer to lose mass. Uh, so if you come back and you weigh yourself and, and you know that you've lost five change in pounds okay and there's factors that that you begin to uh, physiologically uh, lose uh, by losing hydration okay so a loss of 2.5 percent of your body weight will result in performance detriments uh, so decision making and concentration you begin to lose these decision making and, and concentration is huge for us uh, but you'll be impaired by 35% of physical performance potential can be lost simply by losing four pounds. And there's been many shifts I know that I've been on and throughout the shift, especially on these hot days, I know I've probably lost close to four pounds. Um, so a 3% loss, okay, of body weight, all right, a 3% loss of um, weight exchange is reduced muscular endurance, okay? So you're already losing uh, muscular endurance by 3%. Remember, losing four pounds is 2.5%. So if you lose a little more than that, you're getting into areas where uh, physically you're, you're getting challenged and mentally, okay? Um, so uh, four to 6%, that's pretty extreme. Uh, that could be uh, multiple um, working fires in one shift. This is where you have concern because you're going to have reduced strength uh, and endurance, and that's where the heat cramps are going to start coming in. And we see a lot of this on the training ground with the recruits on these heavy days, survival. Uh, you guys, uh, you know, working down there and helping out, you've seen this. You've seen the reduced strength and mental capacity, uh, the heat cramps, okay? That begins to happen at 4, uh, 4 to 6% loss, okay? That's probably losing around uh, 5 uh, six pounds. Um, so you get into uh, six percent or higher. That's where severe heat cramps, heat stroke, comas, and deaths are are related. Um, so just keep in mind dehydration signs: uh, thirst, uh, being thirsty, dry mouth, urine output uh, is reduced, reduced physical performance, headache, uh, feeling ill, diff difficulty uh, concentrating, and sleepiness. Uh, sometimes you just you just need a biscuit. Right. So, <laughs> Sometimes you just you have to replace. There's been many times you come back from these calls. That's I mean that's what we have the uh, staples for. Uh, we have our bread. We have the peanut butter and jelly. Uh, something get something on board uh, and and get the hydration in there. That way you're getting the carbohydrates and the protein um, to go ahead and get that protein synthesis. That's going to help with rebuilding the muscle that uh, you just broke down as well. Um, so, um, keep that in mind, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. That was fantastic. So, uh, good things to think about. And actually, of course, we'll bridge into that um, as we've talked a little bit uh, as well about the mental health aspect of that. And just like Jeff was talking, um, you know, there is decision making that can be compromised. Um, you know, we have a lot of water um, in our bodies. Our body is a fantastic machine. Um, your cerebrospinal fluid is water based. Um, and so, you start taking that away, it starts affecting the brain. And when you make a poor decision on the scene, it can affect you. Um, you know, we are very um, critical of ourselves, probably more than anybody else is. Um, and if it turns into something really bad, that can be something that really lingers with you from a mental health perspective. And so um, trying to just keep ourselves, you know, in a good playing field physically and mentally um, across the board, and across our career. So um, and we'll bridge a little more into that in just a minute. Mike, have you got anything you'd like to add? I just... Um, being that guy and most of the guys on the ignition team know this and crews I've worked with, uh, the dehydration, um, how serious is it is several years ago here at training, I was uh, down here working and we were burning. And to make a long story short, I'm the guy that wound up on the heart cath table the next day, all 
due to dehydration, period, no questions asked. It, I simply had about a chest pain, uh, wound up in the hospital overnight and had a heart cath done the next day. I was transported from training in an ambulance, which that was a whole experience in itself. And it was all due to nothing more than dehydration. So uh, it cannot be emphasized enough with this job. Uh, just knowing the potential you have every day, you have to water up, you have to prehydrate. Uh, it's vital and it could mean your life. It could mean your life. Great. Thank you for sharing, Mike. As uh, somebody, uh, you know, some of y'all may know I, I suffer from migraines. Um, and of course, yeah. we always say if um, you have a headache, you need water. If you have a, you know, upset stomach, you probably need some uh, carbohydrates, some Gatorade. So, um, it's a general rule of thumb to use. So I try to prehydrate as much as possible, um, but I drop water pretty quick. And a number of times on the uh, ignition team, um, you know, I've had to replace my boots uh, halfway through the day from just having them full of water. So, um, you know, it can't be understated in terms of that, of what can happen. Um, but, you know, it can start to trigger those things for any one of us. So your underlying medical conditions um, can come into play, but it could just be dehydration um, that, that puts you... Um, up at the hospital. So, um, you know, continue to stress that, um, you know, obviously uh, when Dr. Walker, um, you know, is able to um, log in, he'll probably speak a little bit more to some of the other medical aspects, uh, particularly to some of the cardiac related events. But um, we're just going to kind of keep moving forward um, today just to be mindful of our time um, and of everybody's time. So I just want to throw the question out there as we sort of move into this. We've looked at a couple of uh, general issues. Um, and I want to kind of think back to the beginning of 2020, because we'll talk a little bit more about things that have changed recently with COVID. Um, but what would you say, and I throw this out to the panel, of course, anybody else that wants to send a question or pipe in, and what would you say is the most critical issue that was facing firefighter, firefighter health and safety at the beginning of 2020? So when we were coming into this year, what was something that was really on your mind? Um, so we'll start with Nancy and move in that direction, give her an opportunity to speak. Put me on the spot. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to remember back when things were normal. Um, my birthday's in February, so that's where I kind of stopped with the normal. Everything kind of went from there. Um, in, in practice, in clinical, in the clinical world that I run around in, um, it, it is and always has been relationships. Um, there has to be a stability in life. And prior to COVID, uh, we saw some problems with, with relationships, with marriages, with families, um, very few resources for those folks. And um, we know that relationships are hard, that, you know, the, the hours that you keep and the time you spend away, the critical time that you are home, it's all very, very difficult to balance in the, in the best of circumstances. So I think um, that was then. <laughs> And I think we can see a shift at this point that it's really more about how do we take care of ourselves? We, we know we have to take care of each other and our families, but the focus now is on resilience. The focus is on bouncing forward from all of this some way, somehow. And to have those resources is key. Um, uh, critical issues are, are individual. I would, I would go so far to say, I was thinking about this the other day, we are all in a critical incident. We are living a critical incident 24 um, seven. It's, it's hard enough to, to experience the ones that you experience over time with your cumulative stress, but you add all of this on top of it. Uh, you, you add family issues on top of it and we're seeing an intense, an intense explosion of stress all across our public safety and first responder populations, which is to be expected uh, we don't want to run from it, uh, but we do want to face it and we do want to have the resources ready, available, immediate for help when it's, when it's needed. Um, I have a little tagline that says, courage is seeking the help you know you need. So knowing that, being self-aware, uh, the, the guy's talking about the science of, of your physical body. It's all wrapped together. Everything is, is one, mind, body, and spirit. And you got to take care of all three of those elements. And if you don't, you're going to know you're not. You're going to have some cues that are telling you you're probably not taking really good care of yourself like you should. Or you just may need to talk to somebody. Um, and I can tell you that over the years, I've cobbled together a good 
group of first responders, savvy therapists. They're out there uh, and they're ready for you and they're ready for your kids and your, and your spouses and whoever else needs some help. So I just urge you to be self-aware. Know when, know when your stress is even higher than you're used to. That would be a good thing to just kind of pay attention to. If you're angrier than normal, if you're more stressed, more tense, uh, shaky, if you're not sleeping, you know, you know what, how you are. So be self-aware. And when you need that help, seek it out and make sure it's going to be effective for you. Um, so that's my long answer to a short question. <laughs> we wouldn't have a panel discussion if we didn't expect <laughs> some discussion. So no, you're fine. You don't have to apologize. So. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Jeff. What was at the beginning of the year? What were some things that you know were maybe on your mind of uh, concern areas? Well, I think I think Nancy uh, mentioned as far as relationships go. Um, uh, relationships have been as far as fun. when when COVID first happened, going into into the new year, we found ourselves being together more say at home, especially those like myself that being on the 40 hour week and being at home and having, and the kids are always around and, and uh, that cabin fever began to set in a couple weeks into it. Um, but it was also a time where we started realizing that we got to get out, we got to move, we got to find some fitness to help relieve a lot of that stress that, that builds up. I mean, a simple, a simple walk, uh, uh, to the end of the block is sometimes all that we need uh, to get out and move a little bit, get the blood flowing, and, and um, uh, you know, that's just going to help us overall. But also going into the new year um, here at work, uh, I started noticing um, more and more folks coming to me or folks in the field uh, with injuries. Um, so injuries, uh, it's a it's a real thing, especially in our in our in our business, our line of work. Uh, so just like an athlete, uh, I always kind of say, as far as um, with a sport, you're going to have an injury. Uh, just name your sport, and then think about the lot, the list of injuries that come with those sports. Think about the injuries that we uh, uh, present ourselves with as firefighters. Uh, try to combat those with designing your exercise programs to where uh, you can you can beat that injury from happening. Okay, so if if you do begin to uh, when you're into your exercise program, have any kind of a red hot pain or uh, as physical therapist, I'm not a physical therapist, but um, I just have an exercise science degree. Uh, but with that, what I've learned in working with physical therapists, I've been injured so many times uh, throughout my career as an athlete. Um, if that red hot pain comes in and you're trying to treat it with uh, your NSAIDs and uh, your ice, uh, you know, your rest, your ice, your uh, compression, your uh, if you're using ibuprofen, um, elevation, if those things begin not to work after about a few days um, to say a week, uh, you may want to reach out to uh, getting it uh, checked out. Um, not a bad idea. That way we can just keep ourselves on the truck. Um, so any questions along those lines, throw them at me too. Uh, but, but injuries uh, can, can be a real thing. Um, I like to, with the recruits on, on Mondays, I almost refer to it as a truck checkoff day. And I'm using it as a physical checkoff day once a week. You got to take a look at yourself, have some type of exercise routine that once a day you're going through all your range of motions and your mobility. Uh, and, and with that, say, all right, this is where I need to work on. Um, but use, use a weekly and, and personal uh, assessment um, check. Um, so, and with, with the uh, mobility exercises uh, and mobility being uh, just your range of motions, okay? Go through a, a, a like a, um, you know, as far as a, not just a strength exercise routine or a cardiovascular, but um, flexibility and, and make sure you move in all planes of movement, which we do as a firefighter as well. But it's gonna increase circulation, it's gonna increase your heart rate, maximize mobility, and it's gonna improve neuromuscular efficiency. Okay, so uh, there's been some recruits that have come through here and almost on a daily basis, they're in the gym before school even starts. 
and they're going through a mobility exercise routine and they're they're doing wonderful things for their body they're getting ready their minds ready for the day but they're also giving their uh, muscles and, and joints everything getting uh, the blood flow in those areas uh, that's uh, going to benefit them uh, and those are good habits to begin if you don't have that habit now try to find that habit uh, because that's something we need to stay in check with throughout our career um, because things just change as we get older um, it just does um, and so think about that um, think about recovery routines uh, um, use that as a recovery routine as well okay so if you go uh, into the day uh, with your mobility um, into the week. Um, have some type of a recovery routine following. Um, that's, we can touch some more on that in a little bit. But. Yeah, that's um, excellent. Um, and I know having worked with the Health and Safety Week uh, for a couple of years, um, you know, one of the things we try to do is in, implement those stretching routines. Because um, I know a number of the firefighter health and safety websites, you know, promote that. Um, uh, we kind of treat our bodies like a diesel engine, like a diesel fire truck. Um, in the middle of the night, we're having to go from asleep to 60, 120 miles an hour with no warm up. Um, but that routine of stretching in the morning and stretching before we go to bed, um, even just like 15 minutes, but going through those can make a huge difference in reduction of the injuries, um, you know, that we do see. Because injuries obviously are are highly, highly prevalent. The numbers of those are, you know, far exceed, you know, the LODDs and the stuff that we looked at a minute ago. Um, so, and that can happen on the training ground just as easily on the fire ground. Um, so I think that those are excellent suggestions just for keeping us, um, you know, at our peak performance. But uh, you're right, things do change as you get older. <laughs> Mike, would you like to speak to any of that or to what you kind of had a, as a concern going into the beginning of the year or things that you had on your mind at the beginning um, of the year? And I, and I don't want to segue too deep into this thing, but uh, I was sitting here listening to what everybody was saying, and I agree with them. Um, but I, I think what Nancy mentioned was what I had seen and, and dealt with and talked with people about financial issues, marriage issues, child issues, and all that. But uh, my conviction is this, is that COVID has not taken the place of those things as much as COVID has made all of those things a hundred times worse. Um, and I've given this speech to a, a lot of people. Um, COVID's a real disease. It really has cost some people their lives. Um, and then I've talked to a lot of people who have had it and, and have recovered and, and they'll all tell you that I've talked to that it's the worst sickness they've ever had in their life. I mean, they're absolutely the worst. Um, but the effect that it has had on us as a, uh, she mentioned marriage. I believe uh, I read a statistic a couple of weeks ago that said since March, the number of people who have filed for divorce in this country has tripled. And it's because the problems that were already there, well, now they're all stuck at home and they're having to spend more time with each other. And they, those problems are just magnified. That's sad. But it's true. 300% increase in the number of people filing for divorce since COVID hit in March. Uh, and of course, this has caused, uh, caused great financial trouble throughout our country and our families. And Cobb County Fire Department's no different. I mean, it's affected a lot of us in a lot of ways. I think COVID has just intensified it. Um, it has caused a lot of discussions. Um, I've sat in the stations and been a spectator and sat back and watched people had discussions, some that got completely heated beyond the volcano. Um, and then I saw people have good discussions where you could tell people's wheels were spinning and they were talking. But this thing has affected all of us in one way or the other. I found myself several weeks ago, I was getting to a point of frustration. I was just frustrated. I hate the news. I just don't want to watch it anymore. You don't know what to believe anymore. And we all know for a fact that there's false information, deliberately false information that's being given out. I won't get into all of that. But the ULP class that I was uh, privileged to be a part of, uh, one of the things I took away from that was a gentleman who said that research has proven. Um, he told us at the beginning of his lecture, he said, I'm going to tell you the secret to happiness. 
And he said, people have climbed mountains and looked for the bearded guy in the cave that can tell them what the secret of happiness is. And he said, research, scientific research, scientific data has proven. And so he went on with this presentation at the end of it. Uh, his secret was being thankful. And I think during this process, the problem I see is that, and the problem I was having was I was forgetting all my blessings and, and you know, here I am, I'm in the spiritual chair. Um, it's forgetting that we still have a lot of good things going on in our lives because we're just bombarded with negativity all the time. And I think that's one of the bigger things that's facing us now is that we're just going to have to choose to, to wake up and say, I'm going to make a good day out of this. You know, um, the folks up in headquarters, I feel for them because every day is there a new SOP they got to throw out there and they know half of the department's going to go, Oh my God, you know, we got to do this. We got to do that. Well, I mean, they're in a decision-making place. I don't want to be in. It's just it, every day is something new. And so um, I think the marriage problems were there. I think the financial problems were there. Family problems were there. Mm -hmm. And that was what I was doing a lot of one-on-ones with people in our department, having a lot of discussions and hearing a lot of things. And I think that not just COVID, but the, the social unrest in our country, a lot of these things has taken the problems we already had and they've just made them 100 times worse because now we got something else to deal with. And so um, I guess in answer to the question, I saw the same thing she did, but I just, I don't think COVID took its place. I think it just made everything worse. And that's kind of what I, what I see and still see. <clears throat> I think those are great points, Mike. Uh, you know, and I think bringing up the relationship piece, you know, yeah. is, is, is hugely important. I know our church had already started, um, you know, doing um, some marriage programs. So I think that that was already mm -hmm. something that our church had identified as something that needed to be worked on. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, like you're saying, COVID has simply um, amplified um, those areas, but um, it's been neat. Our church hasn't backed away from that. Um, they have taken those programs and ramped them and moved them forward. Um, and so that's been, that's been good, but not all churches have been in the position to be able to do that. Sure. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, but we, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take the good with the bad that we get. But I think again, you know, back to Jeff, focus on yourself. Mm -hmm. If you don't take care of yourself, mm -hmm. you won't be there for you, the others that need Absolutely. you, whether that's your family or your crew. Um, but, um, you know, certainly we, we do have other resources every once in a while we have to reach outside of, of those typical mechanisms that have worked for us. Cause we have to realize that, you know, our, our crews, as great as they are, um, that they're stressed. Um, our spouses are stressed. Mm -hmm. Our other family members are stressed. So all those resources that we typically leaned on, just, you know, we're all trying to lean on each other. And, uh, you know, so sometimes engaging in those extra mechanisms becomes hugely important. Um, so um, uh, I know kind of, you know, as we bridge over, just kind of say, and this has already been discussed a little bit, um, you know, what's the most critical issue you see facing firefighters now? I think we sort of touched on that, but I mean, again, kind of getting into that, how has COVID made things, you know, maybe worse? Um, so I'll kind of bounce it to Mike. We'll kind of move this way this time. Um, and I know Dr. Walker has said that he's uh, called in, so we'll let him begin to weigh in as well. Um, but uh, we'll kind of start the discussion, see if there's anything you want to add to that thought process, um, you know, as we're coming around. Uh, schools kicking in um, and other things are starting to, you know, happen. So, uh, Mike, would you like to kick us off this time? Um, I, yeah, it, it, I think that what, what we've already said really addresses a lot of that. Uh, and I think how we choose to, to react to things. Um, I'll give you a good example. I've had discussions with guys around the station about, you know, uh, being very respectful of folks' concerns over COVID. And, uh, you know, even at our church, it's like, hey, if you want to come in and wear a mask, if that makes you comfortable enough that you'll come to church and wear a mask, then wear your mask. You know, do whatever you need to do. But the other side of the coin is, is like when you walk into a store that doesn't require it, but people with masks look at you like you're some kind of deviant or a leper because you don't have a mask on. And then, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't give a rip what people think about me. I mean, come on, let's be honest. We, we, I don't like getting that look if I walk in a place without a mask. And, and so I think there's, as far as our health and safety goes, uh, the critical issues that we face now is, is, is being in conformance with what the department's asked us to do and realize they're doing it for the betterment of, the, of, of us in the department, for our health, 
and for our ability to maintain our mission. Um, I think just taking good care of yourself and uh, being reasonable about it. I never understood why they wanted all of us to go home and lock ourselves up in our houses and rebreathe the same air, but they didn't want us to go outside to a walking park and, and walk. I never did understand all of that, and I still don't. I'm just being honest. I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I just didn't understand it. And I'm like, how in the world can that be better? Mm. And, and, you know, we're, we've learned better. Of course, just as soon as you turn that loose, now you got 500 people, and they're all mm. jammed in together, and we have reportedly COVID spikes. So um, I think just good – there's no doubt that good, healthy exercise, getting out and enjoy yourself, uh, find something to do that brings you some joy, some happiness, that brings you contentment. I don't think physical health and mental health can be separated. And I don't think spirit, spirit, spirituality and mental health can be separated. That, that's my personal. Um, it don't matter to me if you're atheist, agnostic, Christian. I, it doesn't matter what religion or lack of religion you are. Um, I, I think you've got to have some peace for yourself. And I think all of that ties in together. And I think being able to, the critical issue for us now is being able to bring all of that together to be the best we can be on our jobs, but more importantly for ourselves and for our homes uh, in going through this. And, and this thing is like a lot of other things. It's going to come to pass. There's a day coming when this thing will, will have some kind of a solution or some kind of, not finality, but we'll have a better way to deal with it. And we just keep that in mind. We just keep chugging on. Yes, sir. Jeff, anything? Hey, this is you like? um, so looking at the critical issues. Oh, if I can interrupt yes. you, me and James talked about this. If you wouldn't mind, touch to the orthopedic part of this thing. We talked about this earlier about we got cancer on our mind and, and cardiac on our mind. You mentioned the injuries. And man, a lot of them are orthopedic in nature. So if you have thoughts on that, I'd like to hear them. Um, yes, sir. Um, there's now I get this from a uh, physical therapist that's uh, from Portland, Oregon. Uh, he's he's the we had a video out on him, and I also mentioned it uh, with uh, uh, the safety week uh, that we had back in the spring. Um, but I piggyback on him because of his years of uh, in physical therapy. Um, and as a firefighter, um, worked himself. He was an engineer at the time, uh, a driver uh, for the Portland uh, Fire Service. Uh, and then with his uh, years of physical therapy prior to being a firefighter and continues to today, he has his uh, business running out there. Uh, but he does like to uh, refer to uh, uh, as far as physical therapy and checking yourself with the mo different mobility and ranges of motions. Uh, he categorizes five levels of, um, of injury. Um, level one uh, can be uh, defined as inability to function um, as acute chronic injury. Those are usually the folks that have uh, already seen the doctor, hopefully, and, and they're uh, going through um, therapy, and then they hit the back to work to come back to work. Um, so uh, with that, uh, it ranges all the way to a level five, which is you're, you're able to perform and recover at extreme levels. Um, uh, you're, you're an elite athlete at that point. You're, you're, you can take the challenges, you can take the hits, but you're right back in the game. Um, but there are some of us that do fall into um, the middle there. Um, and he even mentioned uh, as far as uh, – uh, a lot of us are in level three, which is functioning pain-free. Um, um, it's more into level two, actually, the decreased function and low level of demand, okay? Um, so we want to strive to stay at level three, which is functioning pain-free. Uh, we have an average fitness. We have moderate uh, level, at a moderate level of demand. Um, so... Um, Reach out to me if, if you want to know kind of what those 10 exercises that he uses uh, um, as far as checking uh, your mobility. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to run you through those. Uh, it is pretty much um, um, head to foot of 
ways to move to make sure that you can move. Um, and did that help answer yes, a little bit where you were? Um, stress, uh, I think, uh, as far as uh, most critical uh, issues firefighters are, are, are facing is, it is, we, we, we definitely have the, the high levels of stress um, that we're dealing with. And a way to fight that is, is uh, for sure, um, you know, where, where I stand is, is with exercise. Nancy, uh, Mike has, has mentioned as far as um, it all works together um, to come together with, you know, to relieve stress is, is not only fitness, but um, you got to have some, some time to yourself. You got to have the um, um, conversations that are, that are needed also to uh, help work through different, different issues. Um, but so good health and physical conditioning are essential requirements for firefighters. Uh, firefighters, we reach and sustain near maximal uh, rates, uh, heart rates, uh, for long periods of time while performing our work-related tasks. Um, firefighters, um, uh, this is something that's real important for us to, to know as far as uh, being in our gear, full bunkered out SCBA. Uh, we're working at uh, 60 to 97 percent um, of our heart rate max, um, simply 60 to 97 percent. But you throw the gear on, we're 27 to 33 percent of that is because we're in our gear, okay? Um, so uh, make sure we're staying in our gear uh, uh, once a week. Do some light workouts. Uh, move uh, uh, in that gear. Um, uh, our, our sweat glands are literally muscle glands, and we can train those muscle glands to be uh, a more efficient, uh, efficient sweater. Uh, if you want to say, um, so, um, we got to stay, stay in the gear, um, with a, a workout, um, more often than we probably are. Um, I see that with the recruits too. If they're out of their gear for more than a couple of weeks and then I throw a workout in them in their gear, um, it's, it's a game changer. Uh, and, and so, uh, we're going to be more effective on our fire calls, uh, if we're that much more accustomed. Uh, in the gear. So um, just fit, physical fitness is, is revel, it's just relevant to staying alive in, in firefighting. Uh, to effectively perform the suppression emergency medical services requires strength, endurance, flexibility, and dexterity. Hey, uh, just to let you know, Jeff, a question was posed about energy drinks. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, we're going to kind of hit a couple of other little things before we move off this slide, but I want to let you know that so you can take a, a minute to kind of think about that. I think going over sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly of maybe some energy drinks, which ones, you know, are healthy for us and which ones may not be as healthy for us. So certainly wanted to address that question since it was posed, but I'll give you a minute just to, you know, be able to think about that. Um, I wanted to give, uh, Nancy, if you're okay, I want to give Dr. Walker a chance to uh, see if he can uh, pipe in since uh, he is on the call at this time. Um, and just to let Dr. Walker know, um, we sort of just touched on real quick, um, you know, some of the various uh, nature of injury that we've seen, especially this year. Um, it seems like the things that we've had in the past that have, uh, causes problems, you know, uh, I think we're pretty, uh, we have knowledge of, we certainly know about um, cardiovascular disease still being one of those top areas. Um, and so and then we were sort of reviewing, you know, what were some things at the beginning of the year that were crucial and what's changed uh, going through COVID. So uh, Dr. Walker, I don't know if you can uh, um, add to the conversation at this point. Yeah, can you hear me okay? We can, yes, sir. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, and, and just to, just um, and, and happy to take any COVID-related questions. So, so I've been been working with Southern Company um, through through the the pandemic, and you know, we've been running a construction site out at Vogel, um, out by Augusta, with 10,000 contractors, and, and kind of working through this process. Um, so, I have a lot of experience, and with our employees. Um, and one of the things that I just wanted to touch on really quickly that somebody mentioned was sort of that, that real um, versus perceived risk and being really sensitive to that, both, both in, in our firefighters as well as in the population we serve, that, that some people, 
you know, the virus is real and it can cause real damage to people. Um, but the way it's been portrayed and, and the way that uh, uh, some people have really an outsized uh, perception of what their risk is, you know, they think that, that, that if they get it, they're, they're guaranteed to die um, and that everybody's getting it. And, you know, we, we know that's not the case, but, but we have to be sensitive to those people um, and those folks. Um, and, and that the perception also goes the opposite way too, just like somebody said, you know, um, that, that some people have no respect at all and maybe they should. Um, so we, we need to be really sensitive to that. Um, but I'm happy to take any, any questions or any, you know, trend questions or anything like that, um, that might be helpful to the group. Well, great. Thank you. And we do appreciate you uh, being able to log in and, and spend time with us. For those of y'all who don't know, Dr. Walker runs SiteNet, who um, is in charge of the NFPA physicals uh, that many of y'all did this year. Um, and if you haven't seen it, Dr. Walker also has a very good class of, you know, the things that keep uh, NFPA uh, doctors up at night. Um, so just, uh, is there anything just kind of other food for thought, any concerns, uh, anything that's different uh, this year than you've seen in past years that you could uh, speak to real quick, Dr. Walker? Um, I don't. I don't know that we're necessarily seeing um, seeing anything a lot different. Besides, I, I know you all touched on the emotional stress, and I, I think it's been difficult. Um, but that you know, that's always an issue for firefighters um, and, and the, the mental health aspects of it. Um, I don't think I'm seeing you know anything necessarily a whole lot different, uh, except a, a, you know one thing is sort of the routine healthcare piece that uh, people aren't getting their their you know, it's, it's difficult to get people in to see a cardiologist. It's difficult to get people to get their routine colonoscopies because, you know, doctors are, are made, because doctor's offices are, are scheduled at such a lower rate right now and people don't want to get out there and do it. So some of our preventive care um, has been delayed. And, and in fact, some of our physicals um, have been delayed. I know we've got several departments in Florida that they're not, they're not even allowing us to come on site and do their NFPA physicals. So we're having to sort of do virtual physicals, which is not, not as good, um, but you know, it's, it's something. So I think that's been a difficulty for us. Very good. You know, and uh, that self care piece, I think we've already sort of referenced it just in terms of relationships, uh, mental health, spirituality, um, but certainly, you know, highly important uh, just in terms of, you know, what we do um, every year in terms of taking care of ourselves. And I know um, I'll, I'll kind of speak to the uh, dermatological component. Um, when we get to the cancer section, uh, but yeah, taking, you know, it's frustrating, but, but stay the course. Um, it's easy for me as an Irish, uh, you know, background to say, stay the course because, uh, our personality does not like to give up, but do try to stick with it. Um, and, uh, you know, work through those frustrations. Um, I've had a couple of virtual doctor's appointments and they've gone very well, but, you know, certainly, um, you know, I, I know it would be better if we weren't in person. So I think that that is a, a great advice and, and thank you for that, Dr. Walker. So, um, just real quick, let Nancy sort of speak to a couple of things, um, then we'll circle back around to Jeff and let him talk about the energy drinks, and then uh, we'll move on forward with our conversation. Um, and so, uh, uh, so Nancy. Okay. Um, I have some thoughts just listening to uh, Jeff, for sure, came up with some really good stuff about working out in your, in your gear. Um, I came across a very interesting website not too long ago, and you need to check it out. Uh, it's called Flexfire Yoga, flexfireyoga.org. Um, this is a gal up in New York working with FDNY folks. She's been their resident yoga instructor, I guess you could say, for many years. She's very trusted. They love to see her coming. Uh, she takes herself out to the stations, to the houses, um, puts them all in their gear with the SCBA, every, everything, and puts them through what she calls her five main positions uh, that she's identified specifically as beneficial for firefighters. Um, she decided to run a little anecdotal research of her own, and uh, it's not scientific, but it's interesting. Uh, she, she trained up a, a few crews for about eight months, and then uh, she compared them with crews who had not had her, her yoga training, and then they measured their oxygen when they had structure fires and other things that they were using with their breathing apparatus. And um, her anecdotal evidence showed that the yoga guys had more oxygen in the canisters when they got done. They were literally controlling 
their breathing even in the heat, the true heat of the moment. Uh, and this speaks really well to what Jeff says. We train our neurobiology. We train ourselves to sweat well. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we are, we are machines. Um, so that's a good thing. That's, a, that's an absolute good thing that everything that you guys are feeling can be, can be made well, can be made better. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a terrible experience to have that happen. So I, I urge you to check out FlexFire um, in your home with your kids. You know, it might be fun to tr- just, you know, do some yoga with, with your family. Uh, the other thing that we're, that we're really pushing right now for the resilience factor is m- mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness is not sitting cross-legged in the lotus position in a, in a field, you know, chanting. It's, it's not like that at all. But we are learning that to be mindful, to stay still in the moment, to just be aware of yourself in the moment, actually changes the neurobiology in the brain as well. I'm really big on igniting that parasympathetic nervous system because a lot of you have trained yourselves not to feel that very much anymore, that relaxation, that total, if you go on vacation and it takes you several days to just kind of feel like, okay, now I'm on vacation. Um, It takes a while to, to... to impact the parasympathetic. And we know that these things do do, do that. And when I train, I talk about the scientific piece of mental health. It's, it's not something that's, that's wrong with you. You're not weak. You're not unable. Um, you are simply not functioning at your, at your best level. And so you can do that. And so when I think of resilience and getting through this time, that's what I think about is, you know, how can we make ourselves better? And use the time that you have. You probably got a little more time in your day than you had before. I would, I would suspect, maybe a little. Um, someone once told me we have 24 hours in a day. It's up to us how we, how we do that. And exercise doesn't take that long. Um, so the good news is, is that you can heal and you can feel better and you can feel stronger and healthier. And you can have fun doing it at the same time. And we need that. We, we have lost our ability to laugh. Um, we are all in loss mode and all of us have lost something, some way, somehow through this time. So I urge you to, to check out the other side, to, to embrace laughter, uh, to embrace the good things like Mike was saying, the, the attitude of gratitude, um, to remember that, you know, we are going to get through this. Uh, we've been through it before, not in our lifetime, but we're here to show that they got through it because they created us. We're still here. So we know that um, this can be better and take care of each other. You know, you guys know each other better, some of you, than your family members. There are five areas that I want you to really think about when we're talking about where stress impacts. It's physical, it's mental, it's emotional, it's social, and it's spiritual. We look at these five factors when we look at addiction recovery. And the same holds true for for stress. If you notice in one of your, your guys or one of your folks any of these areas being impacted in any way whatsoever, we are now seeing research that shows if we impact someone in whatever those, those elements are that they're fighting, if it's financial, if it's uh, protracted divorce, whatever it is, if you can impact them on that level, it's having an effect on our suicide uh, because people are finally heard, they're listened to, and they're getting the help they need way long before it gets to the point where they don't feel like they have any other choice. So not only look after yourselves, but notice those little changes, those little subtleties in your, in your folks. And don't be afraid to speak up at it and talk about your own stuff. Communicate. I would say over-communicating right now is not a bad thing. If you are leading well, if you are leading in a, in a good place to be able to tell folks how you're getting through, um, you know, the more we can uplift, uh, the better for everybody. So it's hard to get out of the loss mode, but there are ways. And and I can tell you, my my, my folks out in the field can help you. They've got some great resources that I can get you to. So there's no reason not to to seek it when you need it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, And I I think to that resilience piece, it's it's better to to build us, you know, whether physically or mentally or all of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, to resist the disease than it is to try to treat it once we have it. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we build that resilience into what we do um, over the life of our career, because uh, I think they're still saying that burnout happens for most emergency service personnel 
around seven years. But most of us are in the career 20, 30 years. Um, so that can be a long downward slide. And we certainly want to avoid that, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually. Um, so, you know, I know that that's a lot of the drive behind the peer support team is, is what is, do we do for that career firefighter? What do you need? It's very different what you need at 25, 30 years than what you needed at five. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's powerful. And uh, again, you know, you know connect. Um, I know my daughter was telling me in one of her in-class sessions, um, the, the teacher is, a, is very sarcastic and they're having a lot of trouble being able to read the teacher's body language because they can't see the teacher's mouth because of the mass. Um, and I said, well, you know, we just had to work on seeing if we can get her to be more expressive with her eyes. And that made my daughter laugh, you know. Um, so laughter is, is, is important. Um, but, you know, sometimes, we, you know, we do. Like, just like we're doing now, we're trying to take our precautions. But certainly, if we're speaking, I want you to be able to see our face, um, you know, and be able to, uh, you know, engage in our, you know, um, what we look like. And so don't, don't hesitate to, to, to read people. Uh, don't hesitate to take that moment um, to laugh um, and, and, and to, you know, in, in enjoy. There is still a lot of things that are to be thankful and joyous for, um, even through all of this. Um, and so, uh, but it's just frustrating because it's more of a struggle than it has been before. So, I think you have to find the humor in it. You mentioned the mass. I couldn't help but think about the guy who told me the other day. He said, you know, years ago, you would never be allowed in a bank with a mask on, and now you ain't getting in without <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth, yeah. you know, that's the truth. So I, I, I think you're right. The resiliency and finding the humor in things, and the things that we can still be grateful for, um, and that will rub off on folks. And I caught myself in the track supply store the other day. I was just singing a song. I heard, you know, to myself, and this guy come up to me and he said, "You're gonna have to leave and come back and start over. We can't have none of that." happiness in here, you know, <laughs> having some fun with them. We struck up the conversation. Folks, you're looking for something to smile about, you know. You should have given me a call. We could have got a uh, duet going. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know that 80s Judas Priest is what he's going to listen. On that note, uh, let's uh, let Jeff follow up with some energy drink information, and uh, I'll check on a couple more questions, and then we're going to move on forward. So, Jeff, go ahead. Yes, sir. And one thing with the mask too is is you can't really tell what folks emotions are as far yeah. as reading body language and seeing what the facial expressions are we're, we're not seeing and uh uh i mean like you right now am i am i smiling or am i upset um but uh yeah and then uh to follow up with nancy was saying too with uh the gear uh there's been many times, you know, on a fire, coming off of a fire, and I'm very thankful for the fitness that I had going into that mm -hmm. fire. And I come off fire, I'm like, man, I'm just glad I even had what I had because that that was very taxing. Um, so we have to keep that in our uh, memory as far as why we're exercising. Okay, we're getting so much more um, uh, benefit than uh, you know just for our, our health. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to help us mentally and physically get through some uh, very tough times. Um, as far as the energy drinks go, uh, I tell you, it's <clears throat> energy, energy drinks, what I see when I go into uh, a, a gas station or uh, you have a whole energy drink section. Yeah. Um, so it's there. Um, it's real. It's, it's caffeine. It's considered a drug. A lot of the, um, um, the energy drinks aren't regulated by the FDA. So um, it is what it is. Um, and too much of it is, is, is can really have an effect on you. Um, cat, so I like to think of it as, uh, and I've, I've mentioned this too, um, uh, to some others as far as uh, avoid the the Ean diet and uh, the Ean diet being the the caffeine, the nicotine, uh, the vending machine. Uh, uh, that that diet can really come back to uh, have. I'm smiling. There. <laughs> that, that, thank you. Um, it's been there a few times. So so with that, it uh, you know caffeine, nicotine, uh, they increase your urine production uh, and through the kidneys. 
uh, and that's why it's considered the diuretic. And you're, you're getting fluid loss. But with that, you're promoting the fluid loss of uh, certain minerals uh, in nutrition. Uh, your salt, uh, uh, you're losing these items that, you know, uh, that, so consider if you, if you are going to have the nicotine and, and the caffeine, know, have some limitations there because know that uh, you're getting the benefit, say, from the caffeine, uh, but you're also flushing out the nutrients um, uh, along with that. And if we uh, depend on, uh, you know, having the caffeine to get us all the way throughout the day, um, there's got to be a, a, a fine balance in there of how you're making sure that you're getting the nutrition, nutrition back on board um, uh, for what you're flushing out. Um, so, I mean, even in the uh, Olympics, uh, there's, uh, the, uh, there's limitations on, on caffeine. It's very, very high, but um, you want to you wanna, uh, definitely keep a, keep a check on how much caffeine um, that you're bringing in and on board. Um, does that answer the question pretty good? Uh, I think, I think, yeah, definitely uh, just a couple of like uh, addendums if I can add them in is number one, I think uh, one thing I've tried to really work with my uh, younger kids on is checking that serving size. Mm -hmm. um, that can be a little bit deceptive when you look at different products um, and, you know, serving sizes aren't always equivalent. Some of them will have the information will be for the can. Some of them will say two, three, four servings in the can. Um, and that can mean you're taking in a lot more caffeine. Uh, from one product to the next if you're not looking at that. Um, so is that something to be cognizant of as well? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. watch. Uh, a lot of us are more uh, caffeine sensitive than, than others. Um, and there's, there's some folks that, that any caffeine on board just doesn't work for them. And um, it's, there's just not the benefit there. But I think the more concern is, is where, what the caffeine levels do to uh, our blood pressure or uh, the stress on the heart. Um, and so we're already going into stressful situations. And then you bring that on. Uh, there's been uh, some firefighters coming in to, for the PAT, and they've had uh, their energy drink, whatever it may be, uh, in the morning prior to the PAT. And they end up having to take a, a step back where they can even run through the PAT because the blood pressure and heart rates are already too elevated. Um, so we have limitations even with us uh, here with Cal Fire that I look for um, prior to running in through the PAT. And if you're over uh, those parameters, BP and heart rate, um, then we're going to set back a little bit. Uh, and some of us haven't even been able to test that day and have had to go to the doctor to see if there's any other underlying conditions um, than just maybe the energy drink that they had that morning. Um, and then the other piece was uh, just uh, are there any kind of energy drinks, um, whether, you know, um, fluid replenishment, I know you mentioned Gatorade, or, but are there some that, that you think are, are, are good? You know, I, I know we kind of hit on sort of the bad or ugly of some of the energy drinks, the caffeine in particular, um, but are there good fluid replacements? Are there good you know, drinks or better drinks, maybe in, in your opinion, um, you know, uh, just a thought. So. There's so many out there. I, I can't even keep up with them anymore. <laughs> um, but uh, they're, they're packed full of whatever their formula is that's they're selling their, uh, how they market themselves to sell their product. Um, but the main thing is, is, is seeing where those caffeine levels are mm -hmm. um, in them. Um, because uh, that's that's where you got to start, you know, making sure that you're bringing on board better nutrition. With that, you know, salt, salt, losing salt through the kidneys with the urine, uh, uh, you're already setting yourself up for um, for failure there. With uh, how the the heart being a sodium, potassium, magnesium pump, it it needs that. So you're already depleting that, you're going to run into situations of rhabdo and um, uh, you'll find yourself just putting yourself under more stress than you need to. Mm -hmm. um, but as far yeah. as all the different uh, energy drinks out there, I, I tell you, I, I, I don't, I'm not even sure, uh, how, you know, what's considered good or not. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you just need to just keep a check on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Could I weigh in on that for just a second on the this is Dr. Walker? Um, yeah, on the on the um, two things. One is and, and you touched on it, and if you need massive amounts of caffeine to get through the day, um, you, you may have something else going on. So you know you may have a sleep disorder um, or, or something else that, that some other medical condition that needs to be looked into. So that that's number one. Um, number two, my, my my concern with the energy drinks um, is that a lot of times, you know, they're not they're not just the energy drinks. So, it, like you said, it's the nicotine on top of that. So now we have two stimulants on board, and then we have some of our firefighters that are that are taking um, stimulant drugs on top of that for ADD and things like that. So now we've stacked um, stimulant on top of stimulant on top of stimulant, um, some of which are causing dehydration. And then all of a sudden we can have arrhythmias um, with a healthy heart and have, have a heart attack in a, in a 20 year old, 25 year old, just like you see with somebody who takes too much cocaine. Um, and and there've been some documented cases of, of, of those in, in firefighters and in young firefighters. So that I, have, I have concerns about um, the, the overstimulant use and then also not looking into, you know, possibility of underlying medical conditions that, that could be contributing to that need for stimulants. Great. So, I mean, especially like your, your leading point on that is that, you know, if, if you're having trouble, you know, staying awake or um, feel like you need the energy drink, um, what's the underlying condition? You know, is it the sleep? Is it something else? I know um, Dale Hudson, when I was up here in training, um, I would a lot of times have a, a cup of coffee in the afternoon because I just noticed the fatigue and he got me to start drinking some of the you know, the, the even more or the, the higher pH waters um, just to see if it helped me, but at least the cleaner waters. And I noticed having a opening up and having a, a jug of water in the afternoon did more for me um, than the cup of coffee did. Um, just not only in terms of just kind of washing that fatigue, but also um, I had a lot more clarity to be able to work on items. Um, so um, what's the underlying, you know, cause, what's the, the issue that you're dealing with? So, so um, kind of, Perfect. We were going to sort of lead into mental health from here. Uh, Dr. Walker, did you have anything else uh, on that that last topic? So, I didn't. No, that makes sense. And just just remember also that that sometimes fatigue is is a is a subset of uh, anxiety and depression. Um, and then and then like a lot of firefighters, the people are just overworking yourself, um, trying to uh, work several jobs, and and so I see that quite often also. Absolutely. And so then, and, uh, I think we you know, may touch on that financial piece as we move through. Uh, uh, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Is everybody still good? Does anybody uh, from the panel need to um, leave in, uh, sooner than later? So. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. Uh, so we'll sort of just, what about mental health? Um, so again, I'll sort of put, uh, I'll, I'll just open it up for whoever wants to talk. I don't necessarily need to keep guiding it back and forth. So, um, you know, from the mental health perspective, we've hit on a couple of things, I think relationships, uh, but is there anything else, um, you know, that uh, we want to consider in terms of firefighter health and safety? Well, if I can just sort of address um, the, the women in the fire service. Uh, so all of these things are absolutely essential as well. Uh, for the females in the fire service. But there's a whole lot of other things going on with them that I think get kind of pushed under the table a little bit. And I know that they're, uh, they're out to prove themselves and, and they're doing a great job, but I wonder a little bit at the, at the toll that it's taking uh, because we do know that, you know, as far as family goes, it's usually mom that, that kind of holds it all together. And um, right now it's, it's really, really, very, very difficult, I'm sure. Um, we have um, we have a YMCA up in Gainesville that I'm on the board, and uh, they put together just a great great idea. When COVID hit, they uh, they opened up a facility for childcare for all first responders at no cost um, for 24 hours if that's what they needed. So these are the things that I think about when I think about some of the effects of this this virus and how it has changed the family life so so completely. Um, and how we have to adapt, we have to flex, um, we have to kind of, you know, figure out what we need to do for ourselves. But I would say, uh, you know, it would be a great idea, I think, to have uh, some, some conversations with some of the gals that are, that are in the service 
uh, just uh, for support for mental support or uh, strategies, uh, techniques, things of that nature. I know that there are some Facebook groups that are out there, private groups that I've been um, a part of that have been very good. Um, we can Zoom so we can see each other. That's also well. Um, but, you know, your hours are very few and very precious. But I would hope that you all would consider um, using some of the resources for yourselves as well. Um, and knowing that you are, you are doing a very difficult job on top of other difficult jobs as well. So take good care of yourselves. Um, you know, put your oxygen mask on first. There's a reason they tell you to do that in the airplane. You can't take care of yourself. It's going to be virtually impossible to take care of anybody else. And if y'all have reached that limit, it's time to call. It's time to call and just uh, talk it out. You know, we don't do, we don't do therapy. Um, I, I tell people therapists are, are, you know, they're in other areas of, of mental health that, that we don't run around in. We do strategy uh, help and techniques and knowledge and resource sharing uh, because that's the thing that's going to hopefully help you get through uh, this, this time, however long it is. So I just, I can't push the resources enough. They're there and I want you all to trust them. Because if you can find the right ones, it, it makes all the difference. And there's none of us that is immune to this. None of us. This is not a rank thing. This is not a veteran thing. This is not a recruit thing. This is a human thing. And right now we're more human than we've ever been. And we don't like it, frankly. But this is the way that, that we're finding ourselves now. So resources are key. They need to be immediate. If you need something at 2 o'clock in the morning, you need to find something at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and I can help you do that, believe it or not. So... You know, I, I run my own company. You know, my, my phone just went off a minute ago. It's with me 24-7. So I'm, I'm available, and, uh, and I want you to hear that because you shouldn't be out there trying to handle stuff alone when it's getting that, that heavy. So. Absolutely. So, and you can believe it. So I've employed with Nancy a number of times, so she's, <laughs> she's always been there. So we really appreciate her. Uh, for that but um, I think you know uh, uh, you know definitely uh, understanding you know reach out uh, we've had those posters in the um, fire stations you know I didn't you know um, know how much help was available until I reached out uh, so reach out you know and, and we are a resource uh, realize our EAP has been restructured through the peer support program to um, ask those questions so they know um, when you call that you're in public safety um, so they can channel you towards somebody who's got more training um, in order to deal with the support that we need. Because, uh, again, it is more strategy driven um, and, and, and a lot of those techniques that we need um, because we do work in a particular um, style of work as well as in a particular culture. Um, and so it's important to understand those dynamics as well. Um, and certainly if, uh, if you've tried and it hasn't worked, um, don't be afraid to try again. I say it's very, very relationship driven um, in terms of the support you get from a mental health perspective. Um, and you may not have a good relationship with the person giving you support. That's okay. That happens. Sometimes it takes a, a, a couple of tries to find that person that you really click with um, and start working through that process. Um, so be diligent um, in terms of that and, and, and engage in any of us to be able to help you with that. Um, you know, we have a lot of resources. We have Nancy's number. We have some other numbers um, that we keep of people that we have referred people from across public safety too. Um, and those people have been good resources for those people. And that's why we keep those numbers um, in case they could be used again. Um, so certainly reach out and let us know. Can I add one more thing too? Please. Um, as far as convenience and, and the availability, 99% uh, of my, my uh, counselors out in the field are doing telehealth right now. Uh, and I've been coaching them, uh, making sure that they're, they're doing a good job with it. Uh, some of them are part-timers. They're kind of doing a combination of things. But in, in my business, uh, when I get a call, uh, I make sure that, that you know that they can see you in different hours. Many of them are nights and weekends right now simply because the need is there. Uh, and you can see them on any of your devices at any time. I've had firefighters walking around the station with their headphones uh, and just chat chatting with a counselor. And it looks like they're just talking to to you know the wife at home so we're trying to make it as easy and simple and effective as we can um, and then if you if you need to see somebody in person I do try to find somebody maybe that, that is geographically close by especially if you need some family help 
uh, so that the kids can get where they need to go to. So consider that, consider telehealth, that you know, this that might be a great way, like James was saying, to get to know a counselor um, and um, you might enjoy that process. So just wanna make sure you knew that was available. And I'm sure it is with your EAP as well. Okay, thank you for that reminder. Yeah, absolutely. So anything else on mental health components, Mike? Uh, um, just wanted to mention to everybody, I was actually trying to look up and see uh, the email address uh, as far as the chaplains go. Um, let me uh, do a infomercial. We do have our chaplains chat. That's uh, nine o'clock the first Friday of every month. We'll be we do it on the Zoom meeting, uh, such as this. Uh, Captain Greg Gober, Captain Rick Long, and myself. Um, and, and when I've talked with people, you know, uh, there's like, oh, it's a chaplain. He's just going to take the Bible and beat me over the head with it. And that, that doesn't happen unless you really deserve it, and then I'll do it, okay? Uh, but it, it doesn't have to be a spiritual conversation or a spiritual need. Uh, we'll talk to you about anything you want to talk to, and it doesn't even have to be a need. You may just want to ask a question or, or a discussion or anything, but all three of us are available uh between the three of us you'll get somebody at any time and we'd like for you to tune into the chaplain's chat that was something that was started as a request as the result of a request from one of our members here in the department and uh but uh as far as mental health goes having a background in cism and then being a minister i can just tell you that i i really am pleased with the improvements and with the um I'm trying to think of the word, the willingness of members of our department to reach out and get help. It wasn't that way 12, 15 years ago. It just didn't happen as much as it does now. And um, there are a, a lot of conversations that happen. And of course, confidentiality being so, uh, so vital and so important. But uh, I, I can tell you that there's a lot of CISM interventions that happen in our department. There's a lot of chaplain talks that happen in our department. And most of them are of a good, positive nature. And so it does work and it is being used. Um, but just don't be afraid to talk to somebody. And I know that's the bread and butter speech that you get from any kind of a mental health presentation. But that's just, it's just so important. Uh, find somebody you've got confidence in, somebody that you've got some uh, relationship with and just talk to them. And I've always said this, that mental health, CISM, and, and, and the fire service especially, uh, it's, it's a term that we've applied to what firemen have been doing for hundreds of years. You come back from a call, hey, man, can you get a cup of coffee and meet, meet me out back, man? There's something I'd really like to talk to you about. We've applied a process to it. We put a title to it, and we've identified it as a need. Um, so um, as far as the mental health piece goes, uh, I think there's a lot of things that still go on that CISM's never contacted for and the chaplains are never contacted about, EAP's never contacted about. You just have a good company officer and a good group of folks and they care about each other and they recognize when something's out of whack, something ain't right, and they address it. And that's what we want. I mean, uh, uh, I don't think you'll ever put chaplains or CISM out of business, but there's a lot of it that's I think is taken care of within the station among a core group of people. And that's the way it should be. We should be taking care of each other. Um, but the middle, I don't know, James, how long have me and you been a part of this CISM thing? And I know I'm speaking more on that now than I am. You sure you want me to say the number? Cause it may bring me stress. <laughs> <That's not laughs> 19, 20 years, 19 to 20 years. Uh, it's been a long time. And uh, but there's been a lot of stuff we've seen and a lot of stuff we've handled. Um, but more and more and more, mental health is a vital part of you having a successful fire department career. When I first joined on, you just didn't talk about it. You, you just didn't. Um, and you sure didn't raise your hand and say, hey, man, there's something that's bothering me. And I think we realized uh, through the statistics, the rates of suicide, and, and even more, more than that, the rates of people who are walking off the job that just, I can't handle it no more. And they're losing their families and they're having trouble with alcohol and things like that. We're seeing more and more people say, no, I don't want to go that route. And they're reaching out for help. And so um, I, I, I think it's a good thing to see. And I'm 500% behind anything we do to help out our people. 
Uh, it, do, it doesn't matter who it is or what it is. Just just get some help, and uh, and we're, we're here for you. Please make use of that peer support. And and just to throw in, I just caught Jeff out of the periphery of my vision. You cannot. Um, don't want to say this and sound bragging. Let's just say that I have lost a little bit of weight. I cannot believe the difference it made in my outlook on life, how I feel, and how I handle things. And uh, I'm just telling you, you're going to have to take care of yourself mentally and physically if at the end of 25, 30 years, you want to be able to play ball with your grandkids, you're going to have to take care of yourself. That's just the easiest way I know how to put it. So, Jeff, you got anything? Yeah. As far as uh, uh, mental health goes, uh, again, with uh, physical fitness, um, we've all heard, uh, or if you haven't, there's a saying, uh, uh, you know, the runner's high. And, and there, so you don't necessarily have to run 100 miles to find that runner's high, but uh, finding some exercise is going to allow to uh, get those, those healthy nutrients throughout the body. Uh, the dopamine release uh, to help you, you know, uh, uh, feel good about what you're doing. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of benefits behind that. The uh, synovial fluid that uh, goes through the joints to help lubricate the joints uh, to keep us uh, more mobile. That's another reason why we want to keep moving. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as uh, uh, sitting here with you all today, thank you very much. I, I do think uh, uh, our department, and we just have so much experience uh, for folks out in our department that we can reach out to um, uh, and get further information if we need to, if we need someone to talk with. Um, but again, I'm, I'm here for uh, any help or, or questions. Uh, I'm excited about fitness uh, and I'm enjoying my job. So. Thanks. I remember uh, a comedian said one time, you know, you get over 30, <clears throat> you break something, it doesn't ever get fixed. You just learn to walk a little different. <laughs> uh, you know, and, uh, and, uh, I didn't realize that was true until I was over 30. You know, I think even the other day, one of my guys said, uh, something wrong with your kneecap? And I said, uh, or knee, captain. And I said, no, not that I know of. And he said, well, you're walking different. And uh, I realized I was. But, you know, a lot of those things just happen subconsciously. But if we're in that mechanism of doing that inventory, I think we realize those things and can make those adjustments. Because as soon as we start drifting and our, our whole gait starts to drift the way we walk, then you start setting yourself up for injury. And those injuries will lead to, again, that mental stress, um, you know, as well. Um, all those unknown questions or, you know, just those questions that are tough to answer. Uh, so we'll move on forward. Just, you know, again, all those things we know that are there um, that we have to deal with. Um, we're not immune to any of that. Uh, most of these things are things that the general public has to deal with. We have to deal with that on top of running calls and doing the emergencies. Um, so it's a real thing. I think we've you know, made the point, you know, reach out, um, engage in the resources that are there um, for all of us. So, uh, so definitely do that. Um, so what about spiritual issues? Um, so let's, let's kind of open that up. I know we've hit on a couple of things, but uh, anybody have any concerns, anything else they want to bring to the table around that? I think I'd like to say, um, when I think about this particular thing, I'm like, not nearly the pro at it that you are, but um, part of what I try to remind people is uh, their purpose and their mission. You're in the fire service, there's a big embedded tradition of purpose and mission. It's changed a little over the years as, as we've gotten into more modern times, but I'm talking about your personal purpose and mission. Mm -hmm. um, why, why are you doing the things that you're doing? What motivates you to, to do those things? Um, where, where is that purpose? Um, I believe a volunteer spirit is very healthy. Uh, I've always been a volunteer uh, from when I was a teenager. And um, frankly, for what I do for a living, uh, it, it's a refreshing reminder that there is normalcy out there uh, because people don't call me when they're having a good day. Uh, and that's okay. But I need, for my own personal uh, well-being, if you will, I need to be around other like-minded uh, volunteer spirit people doing good works because it feels good and it feels, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it invigorates me, frankly. Um, so I would, I would, 
challenge you all to just kind of look at the man and the woman in the mirror and say, you know, where, where is my, my purpose and my mission right now? And if it's a little off center, figure out how to put it back in the middle where it belongs. Because if you go mission oriented and, and uh, purpose oriented, you're going to find a way through. It, it's a deeper, deeper level of, of um, commitment to yourself. So I would, um, I don't know if that dovetails with, with Mike, but that's the way I look at spiritual issues. That's great. And I went to a class at a firehouse, um, you know, the fire services at a calling or a mission or, or a career, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, the speaker had some good points and part of what he talked about, he talked about help, helping people is a calling. Um, sure. and we work in a career that allows us to help people. Mm -hmm. Um, but sometimes the career gets in the way of the calling uh, when your career goals of what you want to do, um, don't quite match with where you want it to go. Um, that sometimes that can interfere with the calling of just being able to go out there and help people. Um, sometimes the best thing for us is, is to run a call. I know I've, uh, you know, I have uh, some strong personalities, uh, down on the South side and, uh, what was especially stressful, I think on the South side was the call volume dropping off. I mean, a lot of the guys want to be down there. They want to run calls mm -hmm. and that's a different kind of stress than other people sure. may deal with. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I know I was the same way. You got to find ways to make sure that you keep that calling at the yeah. forefront of, of what you want to do. And there's more to us than just being a firefighter first responder. Um, you know, I mean, our houses are all decorated. Um, we probably have alerting systems in our houses and all kinds of things, but you are, you know, um, uh, a member of a church, a member of a group, you're uh, a father, a mother, um, you know, you're the child of somebody, a brother, a sister, um, to people in the fire service and to your family, mm -hmm. and sometimes to people in your community. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that that is important, keeping that center um, and, you know, just realizing that, uh, you know, it's very easy, like Mike was saying, with so much stuff going on to get pulled off that center. Um, so yeah. I think that that's a really good reminder for all of us. So. I, I think with what Nancy said about the volunteer spirit, uh, man, historically, if there's anything that's impressed me about firefighters is, man, they want to help. Um, I thought about a group of guys that I worked with at one time. We went on a call and it was a do nothing call, but they noticed that the ladies gutters were completely full of pine straw and clogged up so on their own dime and their own time the next day they went back and they cleaned their gutters out for bloat or driveway on them and that's just what firefighters do that's just that's just what they do and so because of that volunteer spirit um we want to make change we want to make things better and we think every call we're going on we're going to do something and leave that place that person that situation better than when we got there. Now here comes the spiritual challenge when it don't turn out well. And things, in spite of our best efforts, go south. Um, and so um, talking about a, a spiritual issue, uh, it can make even the person of the strongest faith question, well, wait a minute, if, they're, if you're really real, why did this happen this way? And so my CISM is that's what I did. I've, uh, here I am, the chaplain, and I got angry at God. I said, really, we got to go on this call today? This is what we got to deal with today. You know? And so with, with that being said, I think you have to have uh, some sort of, uh, of, of, of ability to accommodate everybody accommodate everybody's problems, everybody's questions, um, and then maintain your own spiritual convictions. And I, again, I, I don't want to sound like I'm being prideful or bragging, but I've tried in my career in the fire department to never push spirituality on anybody. But if you want to sit down and ask me a question and have a conversation, to be available for that and tell you why I believe what I believe. I believe our department is awesome at that. I really do. I like bragging on where I work. I, I don't believe I've worked someplace that I that I hated. I mean, why would you work there if you hated it? And I love Cobb County Fire Department. I, I don't make no bones about it. I stand up for it and I brag about it. It's got problems just like anything else. But um, I've never had any kind of a spiritual discussion with anybody where we got up and parted company and 
we couldn't still be brothers. We still couldn't work together. We still couldn't be together. Um, and everybody knows that. A lot of people know the folks that I've worked with throughout my career, and they knew right off the bat we wasn't going to agree on everything. Sometimes you got to just agree to disagree and go on. And so spiritual issues can come into play uh, big time, especially if you happen to be stationed with somebody who is of like faith and like minded. Boy, y'all have a chance to really mesh. Uh, but just because you don't agree with each other, doesn't mean the mission and the purpose. And, and I, I, I think our department's good, uh, good about that. I, I really do. Um, but don't never underestimate the value of that, the strength of that, and where that can take you and how that can help you. Um, and um, I don't know. I was hoping to have something a lot more dynamic and, and that would make you go, ah, I just don't got it. I mean, it's just basically that simple. Uh, I think we have a place to work here where you can believe what you want to believe and you're fine to disagree with folks and, and or not see things eye to eye and we still maintain a cohesive unit. And I just, I think that's the way it is. You ain't going to never win nobody over by telling them they're wrong all the time. You're just not. So what about cancer? Um, we certainly want to touch on this subject. Uh, I certainly appreciate the, uh, the cancer group that has worked so hard over the last few years uh, to really bring this to the forefront um, uh, in our department. I certainly see this throughout the, uh, the fire service, um, reading a lot of the periodic periodicals and seeing um, so this issue. And I think we, we know that if cancer was considered an LODD, um, what that number would look like, it would be at the top of the list. Um, it is certainly a, a very real thing um, to deal with uh, year to year, uh, still having uh, firefighters who responded to 9-11 um, who are passing away from cancer, um, you, know, um, you know, even this year. Uh, so certainly something to consider. Um, just when we look at overall the numbers, um, we're just across the board, we just have a greater risk of cancer. It doesn't matter really where you look. Some of them are worse than others. So testicular cancer, as you can see, 2.02 times, uh, multiple uh, myomas of 1.5, uh, non-Hopkins lymphoma, 1.5 times brain cancer, 1.3. You can see a number of these things. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, again, our gear protects us. It keeps us from getting, um, you know, killed by that direct flame contact. It has become better at what it does, uh, but it doesn't allow for us to vent. Um, so it's encapsulating, you know, that heat sweat we've talked about, um, the water, the fluid replenishment that has to happen. So you have to realize that uh, the gear is also absorbing toxins into it. Um, and so those toxins uh, can be transferred at a later date. So it's something to, to consider. We've talked a lot about the thin skin around the neck. Uh, protecting ourselves. We have the newer hoods that are designed to help uh, keep from absorbing it there. Um, but I mentioned earlier in the presentation, one of the best things you can do from a prevention standpoint is to get with a dermatologist. <clears throat> Let them go through that initial exam and kind of have a, a you know, a, a trend on where you're at. Um, being Irish, I have freckles, I have moles. Um, my dermatologist says that they're going to take me one piece at a time. Um, so probably about every other year they have to take something and mm -hmm. send it out for testing. Um, that's just, you know, part of my complexion, but it's good to know that's your number one defense um, is uh, your skin. It protects you. Um, so, you know, we'll talk about some things in just a little bit about, you know, to do um, on a regular basis, sunblock and all those things. But that is just something you can really do. Um, it only costs, you know, um, the copay every year to go out and get the dermatological exam. Uh, but my dermatologist sees me every year, goes over and just make sure something hasn't changed. Um, and we picked that up from the Firefighter um, Cancer Support Network back when Damon was going through his cancer battle That's before right. we lost him. And that was one of the things they were preaching back then and you still see. So get those skin exams done, start there. Um, there's other things you can do, um, but certainly peer support can connect you with that cancer group um, if you have particular questions that we can't answer. But um, any thoughts on this uh, from the group that we want to open up to? Um just something to pass on uh, as 
as most of y'all know in our department, it's been recommended that once we do a training burn or you have a fire, <coughs> get a shower as quick, quick as you can and use the Blue Dawn soap. Mm -hmm. Well, I found that to be very funny when I went to, to the doctor recently to get a shot because I had an exposure to poison sumac and I was just to eat up mm -hmm. with it. And uh, he began to tell me what to do to help treat it. You know, here's a prescription for this, prescription for that. He said, the first thing I want you to do when you get home is take you a bath with Dawn Blue Soap. And he said, it, it'll pull that oil out of your skin. And, and, uh, and, and so I thought, well, Doc, believe it or not, hey, here's what the fire department says we need to do. Um, so in just saying that, piggybacking on what James said about the skin, um, uh, having basal skill, basal cell. cell, basal cell skin cancer, and have it, have it removed. I see a dermatologist as well. And it's just amazing um, all the things that can happen with your skin. It's your first line of defense. And how many years I spent just being out in the sun with the sunblock. And, I, and I'm one of those light skinned people. I don't get, I've never tanned a day in my life. I burn. And the damage I've probably done. And so now I have to be a lot more cautious and I have to be a lot more serious about it. So I, I think that was a good point to make. I think the skin is where we really got to start our exposure. Um, in fact, I've been uh, talking with Trevor Levy about uh, our flaps on our helmet. You know, I mean, making sure we address those every time we have a fire. Uh, we go in and do salvage and overhaul. And if we're not wearing our BAs, we've got that nasty old flap rubbing against our sweaty skin with them open pores on our neck. And it just, you know, so that's something he and I have been in discussions about trying to do something with those. But uh, I think that's our skin's number one defense. And we've got to take better care of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another thing uh, that they brought up in the blue card class was um, the pump operators. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times uh, we forget about them. But uh, if we're actually, you know, the 30 foot setback that Blue Card recommends for where we're actually spotting the apparatus, it should be in the warm zone. But a lot of times we don't achieve that just because this, it cannot happen mm -hmm. based on where we actually roll up. Sure. Um, and so it's something to consider. I know uh, one time we were doing a train and burn down here. Um, and, um, you know, as soon as we walked over toward the rehab area, um, our monitors went off. Uh, so the rehab area was in that draft and those, um, you know, those gases were floating into that area. So certainly don't want that to happen. Uh, but again, what are the VOCs? What are some other things that those pump operators can be absorbing? Um, you know, so, you know, if you can transition to something, if a pump operator needs to wear their SCBA to protect themselves, you know, again, it's about the life of your career um, and getting rid of that. And then of course, you know, um, exercise, you know, get not only cleaning, but getting that stuff out of your system um, that you may have absorbed uh, can, cannot be understated in terms of that. But I definitely agree that Dawn helps. I know um, when we were doing MAFSI, a few instructors said this, that they showered at the end of the day with the Dawn and went home. And I know my wife said, you don't smell like smoke. Where, where have you actually been today? Yeah. Um, you know, and I was like, I was at MAFSI. like, you usually come home and you smell like a barbecue roast. And it does, it gets that stuff off of our skin. It gets it out of our system um, and helps us, you know, again, not to take this stuff into our retirement. So. Um, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I as far to... as exercise goes, oh. yeah, let's go Sorry. ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Walker. Yeah, I just want to weigh in, too, on the, um, you know, we, we do focus on the exposures, and the exposures are, are obviously very real in the fire service. But but the other the other aspect that we don't talk about, and, and you hit on it with exercise a little bit, is the um, the fact that, that cancer and, and some of the new cancers for treatment are immunologic. Um, that are out there now that they're aimed at stimulating your immune system. Some of the melanoma treatments, some of the other treatments that they're aimed at stimulating your immune system to recognize the cancer and, and clean it out of your body um, naturally. Um, and, and so if you start thinking about a lot of the cancers, maybe not all of them, but a lot of the cancers are, um, are likely, uh, are, are um, you know, all of us probably have abnormal cells and cancers in our body at, at various times, and our immune system, if it's functioning properly, keeps those either cleared out or to a point that they never become clinically significant. And so, so making sure that we're we're treating our bodies well, and that we're healthy, and we're stimulating, uh, you know, we're getting our sleep and we're keeping our immune systems healthy, um, it goes a long ways towards keeping us from ever having a clinically significant cancer. So, just. 
something to think about. It goes along with mental health, sleep, exercise, all, all the things that we've been talking about. Great. Yeah, absolutely. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, and Doctor, I agree with you 100%. The, uh, uh, with exercise there, it just uh, helps combat the free radicals that are really, uh, you know, just working on uh, knocking us down. But um, with uh, simply just getting out and moving a little bit, it's going to, uh, combat that and, and knock out those those free radicals that are trying to hang on. Uh, so, yeah, with that, with fitness uh, department, if we can, you know, at least try to get in, you know, about three hours. So consistency there, too, with exercise is going to be our benefit. Um, you know, uh, a weekend warrior, um, uh, I find myself every now and then doing that as well. But at the same time, uh, a weekend warrior would be just, uh, just getting all your exercise in on the weekend and, you know, over a day or over two days. But consistency there is also the key with uh, spreading out uh, the workouts. If we can at least, you know, normally we have close to three shifts uh, uh, a week. We can try to get close to an hour per shift. Uh, then our, our busy lives outside the fire service, um, we don't necessarily maybe have to uh, uh, exercise. We can use that for rest and recovery. We can use that for mental health, you know, with your family and friends and uh, going to church. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, as far as finding that exercise, um, you know, uh, maybe we can, uh, you know, just most stations are pretty good at uh, making sure we get in uh, that hour block of exercise. And you know, even the National Council of Strength and Fitness, uh, they recommend at, at least two and a half hours a week. Uh, but I, I'm, I like to think uh, if I'm getting about three to five hours a week, then I'm going to maintain where I am with what I signed up for in this job uh, with everything that's thrown at us. I can pipe in real quick here. Um, so Michelle Ice invited me to the Cancer Network uh, Southeast Conference <coughs> last year. And I learned a lot, um, and I didn't realize how aware I was. But one of the um, one of the presenters talked about your gear, and how a lot of not Cobb necessarily, but a lot of departments are not uh, careful with with the gear after after use. Um, and they were advocating for big garbage bags to put your gear in if you if you're the person that takes it home or whatever you're doing with it. Don't have it near you without it being covered in some way completely. Um, two days after that, I'm driving down the highway and I look over. I see, you know, the the um, emblem of the fire guy on his tag. So I knew he was fireman, big truck. And I kind of glanced over, and right behind, right behind him was his dirty gear, and it was right up against his his head. Um, and it really, I, it really made me think, you know, how much people are not considering where these toxins are hiding and how they're actually getting to the body. Um, the other thing for male firefighters, the testis testicular cancers um, are showing up, I think, in the Dr. Walker, you can maybe back me up here, is because that part of your gear is the least uh, protective between the legs. Um, and so when we talk about the dawn, we talked about doing some extra scrubbing around those areas where you know um, that you've likely had more exposure than other areas might have been. So it was really interesting to, to hear all that, things you never think about. Um, but I wanted to stop that firefighter and tell him what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I didn't. That, that's, exactly, that's exactly right as far as the, you know, scrubbing those areas better is, is a good idea. Um, in, in occupational health, it, one of the original occupational cancers was, was testicular cancer in chimney sweeps. So you can imagine the correlation there. Um, it goes, it goes right along what we see, so. So what about medical issues? Uh, Dr. Walker, anything else uh, to bring up uh, medical-wise, uh, you know, that we may be uh, dealing with or should be uh, conscientious of? No, you know, I, th I think it's, it's always good to, um, um, you know, ma make sure that, that you're getting good advice as far as what, what screenings to do, um, cancer wise and, and what screenings may not be good. Um, we, we do, uh, um, we, we have several departments in Florida that, that do really, really aggressive thyroid cancer screening. Um, and what ends up happening is they end up finding a, a lot of, in Florida, 
I've got some departments that their 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 thyroid cancer rate is you know ten percent or something. I mean, it's 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 really crazy high. Um, but what's happening is they're finding cancers that that don't need to be found, and that's a hard thing to say um, to, and for people to hear a lot of times. But I, I've got a lot of firefighters walking out there without a thyroid gland that probably never need to needed to have that taken out um, because it would have never caused them any problems. And uh, you know, and and so you just have to be cautious with what you're doing and and if it's if it's medically appropriate um and you know trying to follow those NFPA guidelines and then add into them where it's appropriate and then and just just make sure you're using screening wisely doctor i i agree with you i think uh, uh along with captain o'shields mentioning uh, uh dermatology appointments uh you know at least every other year i think as far as physicals go and uh, whether it's a physical or not, just, um, uh, you know, once a year, try to take advantage of our uh, primary care physician um, and, and get our blood work done and, and uh, that sort of thing. It's going to it's going to keep a check uh, in this in this line of work. Uh, I think it's just that's also something that we just need to uh, keep routine checks on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very much so. And, uh, you know, I know that a lot of guys have just given us feedback, um, you know, um, up management just about how um, much they liked the, the NFPA physical, um, you know, the, the the way it was put together, the way it was run, the follow up that happened. Um, you know, there there were a few extra appointments that some people had to have, but they they uh, appreciated you know knowing about and resolving issues well ahead of time, well ahead of retirement. Um, so I know that, but, you know, some people just still are a little wary, um, you know, of that process, um, but I do encourage them um, to print out the NFPA document um, and take it to the primary care. I know my, uh, my primary care before we got the NFPA physicals here, um, looked at that document and, and ordered certain labs for me, um, did an EKG for me, um, certain things were done based on that document. So um, then that used to be on the resource side. If it's, if it's not, uh, certainly let us know. We can circulate it to you, but it's just a general uh, checklist of items that the NFPA recommends be done for firefighters every year when they go to their physical. Um, and so I think that that's a helpful resource for people who um, you know, aren't engaging in the one through the, through the department. But I certainly encourage uh, the one with the department. It seems to have gone very well. Yeah, that, that's a great, and, and the nice part about that document is it, it gets reviewed by medical experts every every two, about every two years, two to three years, depending. And so it, it goes in front of, of firefighter med, medical experts, and it's sort of a best practices document. Um, and, and so they really look at all the, all the available screenings, you know, what is technology done? Or is there new blood work out there that might be better? Are there other screenings that might work, uh, might be more efficient and effective? So, so I, I think it's a really good, uh, it's a really good document and fire service is really lucky to have it because a lot of the other, um, you know, police don't have anything that comparable to that, that, not to that detail. Great. Well, what we want to do just in closing out, we've got a few slides here um, and certainly I think we've weighed in on a few of these points, but um, just getting into some recommendations in each of these areas, um, you know, uh, I know your time is precious at the station and those of y'all who've uh, stayed with us through the whole presentation, we appreciate that. Um, so we'll try to be diligent and be done at least in the next two hours. So uh, I'm kidding, hopefully in the next, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Um, but uh, just a couple of things just to think about. I think we've hit on this. Um, obviously, some good recommendations, medical screenings, um, fitness and wellness programs. I think Jeff has hit on that. Um, training, um, you know, definitely, uh, you know, don't hesitate to review policies, to review these documents, to train on these aspects. Uh, Jeff even mentioned the functional firefighter fitness. Uh, do some exercise in your gear. Um, incorporate those areas into training. Um, you know, crawl, walk, run. Um, it's a great concept, you know, don't hesitate to, to start in your station uniform, but finish out the drill um, in your full gear so that you're keeping yourself acclimated um, and ready to go. And then, of course, just training like uh, hopefully this discussion today has been and some of the other classes during Health and Safety Week um, have brought things to your mind. Um, medical clearance, uh, some people have very uh, have expressed a concern in this area um, as with the NFPA physicals. Um, the goal of the physical was never to take people off of the truck, um, but if for some reason, if, if you have a condition um, that needs to be addressed before you come back to work, um, take care of that. When my back went out, 
Um, it took me about two months to get back on the rig. Um, but there was a process to go through to make sure that I was ready. If I tried to get on before I did that process, I would have re-injured my back and I would have been out longer. Um, so those mer- medical clearances are there to, to help us to make sure that we can perform at at least that minimum level, but we want to be at our, our best version of ourselves. Um, we have a lot of operating procedures and practices um, that are there. Um, review those, take time in the morning to go over, uh, pull a policy out. Um, to engage with NFPA 1500 um, with the documents that we mentioned for your physicals um, and other guidelines. Um, In terms of incident command, we mentioned this earlier, during these hot months, don't be afraid as an incident commander to call for an additional unit. Um, Spread that that work out over a number of crews. Um, Strategy and tactics, obviously, you know, um, one of the good example of that is uh, wear your SCBA until we know that those gas levels, you know, we don't, we haven't talked as much about the toxic twins in the last year or so, but, um, you know, making sure we're not breathing in those gases. Uh, Communication, obviously PPE, our PPE is really, really good. We're very fortunate. We're on a five-year replacement cycle um, here in Cobb County. Um, A lot of departments don't have that. They don't even have backup gear. Um, So just realize that. And of course, staffing, Um, it seems like when bad things happen, when we're at low staffing, um, you know, the summertime is tough with holiday uh, or people going on vacation. And that just means that you're going to be, um, you know, fewer people are going to be lifting that load, I guess is the best way to say that. So pay attention to those things. So I think those were some good recommendations to have. Um, anybody want to weigh in on any of those thoughts? You might want to mention the quarantining. Uh, quarantining. Staffing. Yeah, absolutely. Quarantining has impacted staffing. And of course, from that perspective, a lot of people have been picking up extra shifts. Um, just realize with some of the things that we talked about that that increases your exposure, not only to COVID, um, but to some of the cancers, some of the other things dependent upon the, the calls you're running, as well as just the mental stress. Um, so just, just make sure, again, that you're taking care of yourself. So, other thoughts? Okay. Keep that down for a minute. <laughs> So um, just improving firefighter health and safety, any uh, final nuggets uh, for thinking about improving firefighter health and safety? I would just sit here thinking, um, you know, you come in and you lay out what your day's got planned and everything, and you never know what's going to break up your your plans or what's going to happen or when you're going to get that career call. Uh, I just make a plan to have some fun while you're on duty, get your work done, have a time to relax, have a time to do something together as a crew. Uh, remember, we got the best job in the world. I mean, the absolute best job in the world. And sometimes we see the very worst things that you can humanly see. Uh, just make a plan every day to, to have some fun, whether you get out and shoot some buckets with a crew or you, you sit at the table and play a game of cards or whatever you do. Just enjoy your time at work and have some fun. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, Think of uh, as far as fitness goes, uh, your workouts, they don't have to be um, uh, zero to hero every day that you work out. Um, Know that uh, uh, the consistency is what you're looking at there and uh, just moving a little bit, uh, especially while you're on shift. I think it's, it's gonna, it's gonna bring better morale around the station. Uh, It's it's gonna uh, allow for your uh, nutrition to be absorbed better. It's gonna allow you to rest better. It's, it's all around. Um, it's going to help combat so many things that try to attack us. Wow, let's see if we can take it off. <laughs> um, I guess in closing, I would just say use your courage. Courage is knowing you can seek the help that you need. Mm-hmm. Then, by all means, um, we have more resources today than we've ever had in the fire service on the mental health side. Uh, you guys have always been very, very good and, and upfront about your mental health, but um, we're seeing even more enlightenment as far as what the, the resources can do to help you get through this. You're not alone. Um, your family's not alone. Um, if you're not a part of a group or, or part of a network, um, that's okay. It's, it's a matter of just knowing where the resources are and using them. That's the key. Um, I can't tell you how many times post suicide, um, when I go out to do the debriefings, I hear about all the red flags they saw that they never really thought about. 
that could have been probably handled if they just had that one more chance to do so. So be aware, be self-aware, be aware of the people around you, um, and do keep your morale up, keep that resilience up, do what you have to do to just get through. That's how we're going to make this thing work. So a couple of final recommendations as we uh, sort of move forward. Number one, uh, the document came out from um, our cancer committee. Um, so the, the prevention recommendations, again, learning about your gear, uh, make sure that you respect, better understand your gear, um, wear your, uh, or wash your hands after every use, um, use the uh, firefighter wipes that we have. Uh, they're actually trains going through and evaluating a new set of wipes. Um, so we may have some new ones. So use those wipes on scene, don't underestimate. Uh, getting that stuff off your body uh, quicker. Um, never transport your bunker gear in your vehicle, um, unless it's in a bag or a tote, you know, uh, make sure that it's clean. You just don't need to, again, be breathing in any of that stuff that could be drifting around the car. Uh, we've talked about showering, keeping yourself clean, um, change, keep that extra change of clothes, bag up your gear on scene, bring it back, extract it. A lot more um, extractors out there as these new stations are being built with extractor rooms. Um, so take care of that. Um, you know, uh, we've got now places to store our gear. Keep the gear out of those living spaces. Mm -hmm. Don't wear it in on tours or um, on uh, pre-fire plans. Uh, try to keep it away from, um, you know, the store and other items like that. Um, and just clean it, store it, um, and uh, just, just again, be respectful of what it could have in it. If you're doing a station tour, uh, try to get some uh, somebody with fresh gear or mm -hmm. use a backup set of gear. Um, especially if you're doing high fives with the kids, make sure those gloves are clean. Uh, we don't need to get somebody in the community sick. So just some things to think about. In terms of COVID, uh, again, pretty similar recommendations. We kind of know these, uh, but one thing again to come back and stress is that washing your hands. Um, I know when I used to teach uh, disaster preparedness in the CERT program, we actually go over washing hands. And one area that most people miss when they're washing their hands is the thumb on their dominant hand. They don't clean that very well, if at all. Um, so make sure you've got good soap and water, good hot water, be able to um, kill that bacteria. Um, you know, that's what we want to do. It's obviously, it's a cleaning, disinfecting, and sterilization um, three-step process to get rid of as much of the bacteria, as much of the viruses as we can. Um, but everything else, you know, that we have as recommendations um, obviously help. And beyond anything just try to keep from touching your face um, i have allergies and so i've always tried to be very cautious about that um, but try to keep that because that again you're contacting your face and possibly putting the, the virus it now into your uh, mouth and into your nasal cavities so in terms we just said cleaning disinfecting and sterilizing <clears throat> don't underestimate surfaces in the apparatus that you could be touching some hot spots this is a rescue uh, you've got gear shifts, you've got console controls, you've got the MDC, the radio, the steering wheel. Um, so just some places. Uh, we do have disinfecting sprays, wipes. Um, you know, I've even uh, gotten one of the UV sterilizers. I use that on occasion. Um, so just some different ways. Again, it's not one or the other. Um, the better we clean, disinfect, and sterilize, the less chance we have of, of getting sick um, from any of the diseases that are out there. Um, obviously, COVID being one of the primary ones. Um, and when we look at the engine, don't forget, again, about those controls. Don't forget about your headset. Uh, we, will we overlook that area? Um, the SCBA brackets, uh, making sure the SCBAs are clean. That uh, should be part of the Monday checkoff. We should be taking them off once a week. But, um, you know, sometimes uh, we get into a little bit of a, of a quicker modality. And uh, that can mean that we're missing a few of these steps. Um, so it, it's natural that it happens. Um, but again, just try to maintain that diligence throughout this process. Um, and of course, hand lights and even the pass tags can be an area where um, bacteria is resting, waiting uh, to be picked up by us. So, and of course, medical physicals. Um, I think Dr. Walker's mentioned that. Jeff's mentioned that as well. Um, you know, working through that process and making sure that you at least have a plan for getting it done. Um, uh, but, um, you know, obviously we've got it. I'm here through the department as well. Uh, any closing comments on any of those ideas or um, anything from you, Dr. Walker? We may have lost him. So. <laughs> All righty. Um, any other thoughts from the panel? Mm -hmm.
Thank you for having me. Yeah. Let me check real quick. Make sure there's no questions. I think we're good. So I didn't see any other questions post. Um, obviously, this is your forum. We're here for you. Um, please send us feedback, uh, whether you call me, text me, send me an email. Um, you know, certainly uh, would appreciate that. Uh, I want to give a, a big thank you to Dr. Walker, who was able to call in, um, to Mike for being here, Jeff, Nancy. Um, you know, uh, they take time out of their day to be here. We're here for you. Um, let us know, again, if there's something you want us to discuss at the Officers Forum. Uh, we're looking at doing another forum in October and then December. I'll be working with command staff on that. Uh, ideally, we want to have it back in person, um, but, you know, I'll be working on those dynamics um, because uh, obviously, you know, even though panel discussion I hope was helpful, I know many of y'all would like to be together and be able to discuss in the forum, com uh, forum part of what we do, maybe some issues that you're dealing with at your station. Um, so we'll, we'll be working toward that and hoping for bigger, better, um, more joyous things uh, in 2021. Um, but please let me know if there's anything that, that we can do for you um, with the Officers Forum. Um, and, and again, thank you for taking the time out of y'all's day um, to be here and be part of the, the Zoom meeting. So um, with that, um, that's all we've got for you. Thank you for your time. So.